handing over to Harriet and Flora um, from Garfield Western, who will be talking through um, their grant programmes today. Thank you, Nicola, and um, hello everybody. It's really nice to meet you all virtually. My name's Flora Craig and I'm the Head of Grants at the Garfield Western Foundation, and I'm joined by Harriet Brooks, who's our Grants Manager. Um, we've got some slides to go through with you today, so if we get the slides up, then I'll, I'll get started. But um, it's really, um, it's nice to be able to meet you. As Nicola said, normally you'd all be meeting in person, and you know, I think we're all dying for a time when we can all get back to doing that. But at the moment, this seems to be a very good format and an opportunity for us to meet lots of potential applicants and tell you a little bit about how you can apply to us. And hopefully, in the course of the presentation, encourage you, if you're eligible to do so, to be able to... Um, Make, make that application. So um, once we've got the slide, I can't see the slide yet, so I'm just hitting the cut. Brilliant. So just before I get started, you know, obviously this is an advice session to tell you about how you can apply. And um, before I begin, I just really want to say, uh, you know, a massive thank you to all of you for all the work that you've done over the last year, which has been a year like no other. And I think the trustees really appreciate um, the hard work that you've done as frontline charities supporting those who've really needed help at a time when um, everything has gone completely different for them. You know, there's been enormous need, you know, from food, poverty, isolation, loneliness, all, all of those things. And um, I think, you know, we, we and the trustees have been incredibly impressed by the resilience of the voluntary sector and um, your ability to adapt, your ability to suddenly move online and continue to support people, even when you've been faced with your own challenges. So, you know, we're aware that that comes at a, you know, a really high cost and um, in terms of your staff well-being, your own personal well-being. But um, I think, you know, the trustees really recognise and appreciate all the hard work you've done and, and the amazing support you've given your local community in, in the last year. So I sort of wanted to start with a thank you, which sort of is an unusual way to probably start, on, but, you know, it's a huge thank you to you and thank you for joining us. As um, Nicola said, we, we will do some questions at the end, so by all means ask questions in the chat. I hope to cover most of the sort of basics about applying, so hopefully as the talk goes on you'll, you'll realise that we're covering most of the things you probably have questions about. But at the end there'll be an opportunity for, for a quick, um, quick question and answer session before we move on to your next part of your day's agenda. So if I could have the next slide please. I thought it'd be really helpful just to give you a brief overview of the foundation because I think you know we're all if you've met some of the other funders this year and I think you have we're all very different in the way that we were set up. We are actually a family foundation that was established in 1958. It was established by somebody who was called Garfield Weston. He was a Canadian businessman and he moved his family to England in the 1930s to set up a successful business empire. Um, he then decided in 1958 to um, create a foundation for the benefit of the, of the country. And to do that, he gave an endowment of shares in the family business, which is called Whittington Investments. So we are a sort of shareholding foundation and our income comes from the good work that the businesses do. Now, Whittington Investments, which is run by the Western family, has a range of different businesses, which include things like hotels, it includes properties, it includes retail, like the famous Fortnum and Mason store, and it also includes Associated British Foods, which is a, a, a major company that has brands like Twining's Tea, Primark Fashion, and King's Mill Bread. So the family are very involved in their business. They do very ordinary um, things like tea and bread and things that you'll find in your kitchen cupboards, and that good business is what helps this foundation do the good work that it does. The family are the trustees, so all the family, all the trustees are di direct lineal descendants of the founder of Garfield Weston. Um, so the decisions are made by, you know, successful business people who are not only active in the work they do, but they're very um, conscious and knowledgeable about the voluntary sector. And as you can see, have, you know, 60 plus years of experience in grant making. So um, know, know the sector well and are very hands on and engaged in the work that, that, that the foundation does. Um, they're, they're, we've, been, we've been able to give over a billion pounds over the last 60 years and in fact last year we, we kept our doors open and we gave a, ne nearly 99 million pounds to over 2,000 charities um, so we get about 4,000 applications a year and last year made about 2,000 grants um, across the voluntary sector 
And so hopefully that will give you some encouragement that, you know, there is an opportunity for you to apply to us because, you know, we continue to make grants today and we do so on a, on a daily basis throughout every year that we operate. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Just briefly, we touched on COVID-19 at the beginning and the fantastic work you've done um, in terms of supporting your local communities. I just thought it's useful just to let you know about our response during this time. We decided that we would remain open. I know some funders decided to rethink their priorities, maybe close their doors for a bit. We stayed open, made grants. Um, as I said, we gave 99 million pounds last year, last calendar year, last financial year, sorry, to, to um, um, organisations across the country. We always actively encourage new applications, so please don't feel when I say that we've given all these grants that if you've never applied to us or never had a grant that this means that you're not part of the club. If you've never had funding from us in the past and you're eligible to apply, I'd really encourage you to think about doing so. Our trustees, as I've said, you know, they're, they're successful business people. They take a very pragmatic approach to grant making and particularly over this time have been really looking at, at how they can help give charities resilience. We support core costs, but equally we'll support strategic projects if there are things that you know you, your local community needs and that is something that's gonna support them to do better and be more successful. Um, <clears throat> we also last year did created a, a 30 million pound fund, which is called the Western Culture Fund. That was very much in response to trying to support the arts and cultural sector which, as you all know, um, was very much, you know, in trouble last year with its doors closed, unable to generate income, and of course, unable to give us all the kind of arts and cultural experience that we all know and love, you know, in our in our local areas. Um, we've we've all had to work from home. I'm sure lots of you are still at home. Harriet and I are both in our respective homes today, slowly thinking about going back to the office, but like everyone, waiting for guidance and. Um, and what that's going to look like. But um, at the moment, um, we've been able to um, work from kitchen tables and bedrooms and all sorts of things over the last year, like everyone, and have you know continued to be exceptionally busy. So if I can have the next slide, please. So this is really an opportunity to tell you about how to apply. I, I'm gonna cover you know, the basics about what um, you need to know before you make an application. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of things that we see in applications that we think are great, things you should focus on, and then perhaps talk about a few things that we think are perhaps not so good in applications that you should be aware of. And then, as I said, there's an opportunity for questions at the end. So if I can have the next slide, please. So in order to be able to apply to us, you need to be a UK registered charity or a CIO. We're not, I'm afraid, able to support CICs, and um, we look to the Charity Commission for eligibility. So it may be that you are considered to be exempt um, or accepted under Charity Commission guidelines. And that would include, for example, some schools, it would include faith, some faith-based organisations, particularly Church of England churches. If you, if you fall either as a registered charity or one that is considered to be exempt or accepted, then you are eligible to apply to us. Other organisations, I'm afraid, aren't eligible to apply to us. So that's our sort of goal, our first entry point. If you can tick that box, you're welcome to apply. Um, in terms of, I've said before, we fund across the whole of the UK. So our money is, we try and spread our money as widely as possible. We're always interested to hear from charities that, you know, are doing work in an area that perhaps we haven't been able to fund in the past because people haven't let us know about the great work that they're doing. So, um, it doesn't matter where you're from, you're welcome to apply to us if you're eligible to do so. Um, and we fund across a whole range of categories. So we're a very broad funder and we fund across a whole range of categories and they're here on the screen, youth, welfare, community, which I think are very particular interests of the trustees, and then environment, education, health, faith, arts and heritage. Now that, that sounds like a, a very wide mix and it's purposefully wide because the trustees um, like to fund good applications from all of those different types of organisations. But the important thing to tell you is that there's no set pot of funding for any of those particular um, categories. So we don't set aside at the beginning of the year a certain amount of money for youth or a certain amount of money of education. Every application that we look at is always on its own merit. Um, so even though when we ask, when you apply, you'll be asked to tick the box that represents you best, so if you, the majority of your work is youth work, tick that youth box. 
don't think that that gives you any disadvantage or advantage over anyone else. It's every application is looked at on its own merit. So the categories are really a way that we can track funding through the organisation um, to make sure that we're giving as broadly as we can and responding to the need that is out there. So um, don't, you know, I think people worry about categories. It's really nothing more than an opportunity for us to just understand the main work that your organisation does. I think in essence, you know, the trustees are really looking for applications that can really describe um, the work they do with the benefit, with their beneficiaries. So they're looking to fund good people who are doing good work and making a difference to people's lives. So I think, you know, again, thinking about your work, that's the kind of message you want to be conveying to the trustees about the work that you do. There are a few things that we don't do. We don't fund animal charities, animal welfare charities. We don't fund individuals. We don't fund projects outside the UK, even if that charity is registered in the UK. And trustees don't tend to like to fund events or festivals or indeed um, charities that are sort of prioritising campaigning or lobbying work or a sort of membership bodies. Like I said before, their real interest is funding great charities that are working directly with beneficiaries who are in need. So again, that's a sort of useful sort of focus for you. So can I have the next slide, please? In terms of types of grants, we have just two major, two main programmes of our grant making and the way that you apply is broadly similar. The first is our regular grants programme, which is for grants of under £100,000. Now, this is the majority of our grant making. It is um, over 90% of the volume of our grant making and it's really aimed at small to medium sized charities, probably people like yourselves who are on this call today. We do have a major grants programme, which is for grants of £100,000 and above. These are handled slightly differently and there's information in our guidance about how to go about that. But broadly, those are for organisations that have at least a million pound turnover and or a million pound project that they're working on. So they're much larger scale projects. What we tend to ask people to do with major grants is they have to write a very brief outline of their project and the costs and the timeline, the fundraising plan. And then we'll give very specific and bespoke advice to that charity about how they might make a major grant application. I'm not going to focus too much on that today because I think the majority of people on this call are probably more interested in our regular grants program. So I'm going to I'm going to focus on that with you. But if anyone has a question at the end, by all means, do ask it. So the three the, within our regular grants, trustees are aware that you know they want to fund what you need the most, and we expect you to ask for what you think is the most important thing for your organisation. So we're able to um, offer you funding that is unrestricted. Some people like to call that core or revenue funding. We also can support your projects. Say, for example, you've got a new project you want to start up in your organisation. We may be able to give you some funding towards that project starting up. And we also fund capital projects. So by that, I mean bricks and mortar projects, you know, an extension to your village hall, a new minibus to get your beneficiaries around. So it's the actual sort of stuff that you need to buy. So all of those things are available to you to ask for. Um, in terms of um, capital funding, it's important to note that we, I think probably with all our applications, it's always useful to have some funding already confirmed before you come to us, rather than coming to us with a fantastic new project that you haven't really worked out where you're going to get the money from. Try and think about what it is you're looking for and who else is gonna help you make your work happen. So, and capital projects, we also like you to be well advanced with things, for example, like planning permission or any other permissions that you need in place, and probably about 50% of funding as well in place before you start to ask us for a contribution towards your project. So those are the kind of, the, the mix of things that you can ask for. Um, we're also able to make multi-year grants. So for those of you who I think trustees really recognise, particularly at the moment, that some financial stability is helpful, knowing where your money's coming from for the next couple of years. So we do offer multi-year grants for up to three years. If you want to make an application for a multi-year grant, you're very welcome to do so. We would expect you to be able to provide the budgets for the years that you're applying for. So if you want three years funding, we need to see three years of budgets, we need to see three years worth of your fundraising plan, and the trustees can then take a view. Occasionally, if you're new, new to us, it may be you ask for multi-year funding and the trustees think, well, we like 
what you do, but we'd like to just give you one year in the first instance. That might just be something that they decide to do in order to be able to see how you get on, what your report is like in terms of your impact. And then, of course, you're eligible to apply to us again, should you wish to. So the good thing about the foundation is that our doors are always open and that you can apply again 12 months or longer, depending if you've had a multi-year grant, after you've had a after you've either had a grant or you've been told you're not, you haven't been um, accepted for a grant. So there's always another opportunity. And I think if, you know, I would encourage you, if you do get a decline, and sometimes we have to say no to great applications, don't, don't think that means you can never come back. It means that, you know, regroup, rethink, have another look at the way you might have applied and try again another year because it's, there's every chance that you might be successful another time. So please don't write us off just because you've had a disappointed no the first time. We do, um, we don't fund specific named salary posts. And, and what I mean by that is that if you, for example, want to increase your staffing and appoint a new operations manager, for example, we won't just pay their staffing costs. Um, we do, however, anticipate that staffing will be part of a core cost application. So it, we absolutely understand that staffing, you know, is a cost to you, add it into your core cost budget and trustees are happy to make a contribution to the, towards the broad cost of your staffing. The reason they don't fund specific posts is that, as you can imagine, they don't want to have the financial responsibility for the security of a member of your staff in your team. So, for example, if they chose to fund a specific member of staff for a year and then you came back and said, could we have some more money? And they decide to say no, that person's job could potentially be in jeopardy. So that's why they decide, you know, very happy to give you generic core costs that can be used towards staffing in the broadest sense, but they won't fund a single salary post. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So in terms of our application process and timeline, what you should expect in terms of when you first apply to us. Um, the first thing, and I'm sure in every funder talk we've had, um, we always encourage you to read the guidelines. The guidelines are, are there to help you. We've, they've been written by us based on the questions we get. They're written by those of us who are experienced fundraisers and know what it's like to try and raise money. So we have spent a lot of time trying to make the guidance as clear as possible. And also, uh, I suppose, uh, an opportunity to sort of create a kind of format for how you can put together a great proposal if you've never done so before. And I really would recommend when, if it's the first time you've applied to us, use the guidelines as your kind of scaffold for putting together your proposal. All the headings that we ask for in the guidelines are things that we need to see in your application. So feel free to just put those headings down and follow them and provide information under each of those headings where relevant. So, you know, do, do use them, they're there to help you and um, they will help you structure a really good proposal for us. And then you can be confident that you, you, you've given it your best shot and told us everything we need to know to make hopefully a positive decision. So you have an opportunity to either apply online or in the post. Um, we have an online website now, so we have a, a portal through which you can put your application. To be honest, I think 95% of our applicants now apply online. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. And only if you feel very daunted by that and just don't like the idea of applying online, you're very welcome to send an application in via the post. I'd say at the moment there's a big caveat around that, but obviously the post is taking longer because, as I said at the beginning, we're not all in the office. So it needs to kind of go on a little journey around people's houses in order to get into our system. So if you can be brave enough to apply online, I'd strongly recommend you to do that because as soon as you've applied, then you'll get a, a response straight away saying your application is safe with us, it's in the system and it starts its journey through our assessment process. Um, the one thing I'd ask you not to do is don't apply online and then send us a postal application because that causes, as you can imagine, some confusion in our system because we somehow end up having you twice in, in the system and, and um, just do it one way, choose which way you want to do it and stick with that. Um, we don't have any deadlines, so you don't have to worry about getting your application ready by a certain date. We really want you to apply when it's best for you to do so. So we really want you to, um, you know, come to us when, when it suits you, when your application is ready, when your case is strong and you've made, you know, the decision that you want to apply to us for funding. Um, you can only apply with one application at a time. So I also would suggest that you think strategically about what your financial plans are 
for the next year to 18 months so that you're coming to us for the thing that you need the most, but also if you're successful or not, you won't be able to come back for another year. So don't come for something that you need this autumn if you know that, for example, you've got a major capital project on the horizon next spring, because you might end up shutting yourself out of a, of a bigger ask to the foundation for a bigger project. So think ahead, and I'm sure you will sit down and think about your fundraising strategies, but when you think about applying to us, just make sure that you've thought through how to do that and how that's going to really benefit strategically, you know, the right moment to make your application. Um, we don't have an application form that you have to fill in, so we don't have a sort of tick that box approach to your, um, your application. We ask you to write a proposal in your own words um, that you can um, tell us about the, the good work that you do. So, um, you know, it, it's for you to describe exactly how you work. And again, by all means, use the guidelines as a kind of way of structuring that if that's helpful. Once we've got your application, your application will be reviewed by the grants team, so me, Harriet, some of our colleagues. Most of us have experience in the voluntary sector, so we are sympathetic to what it's like to find, have to fundraise for money. So, we, you know, we are looking at them with some, you know, experience of having um, had to do this kind of thing ourselves before. So once we've reviewed it, we then um, pass it, we might come back to you and ask you questions, then we pass the application on to trustees, and um, they're the ones who will make the final decision. So uh, just, to, just to reassure you, they are able to read the applications, they read the applications in order to make decisions. And um, as I alluded to at the beginning, it's a family foundation, it's the family that makes the decisions. So you can rest assured that there's not some interim process whereby we decide who, who which applications are seen by trustees. Everything is seen by trustees. There's no way that we can make a decision without them having seen an application. They do that bit for us. We do the bit, which is making sure we've got all the right information and presenting it to the trustees. Um, we, we have a sort of rolling programme, as you can imagine, if there are no deadlines. So applications are reviewed in order of receipt to be fair to everyone. And I think this goes back to you thinking about your fundraising strategy and when to apply because what we want to do is make sure that you're applying for enough distance in the future that you're not applying for something that's urgent in next week or something that will have actually happened by the time that you've, um, you've, you've applied to us because we can't fund retrospectively and we're not able to, we wouldn't be able to support you if the project will have been completed or within the process of being completed before we've had a chance to look at your application. So it takes us sort of up to 12 weeks, sort of around three to four months to get you a decision. So I would always advise you're thinking about an application for activity in four to six months time. So make sure you're thinking ahead so that we've got plenty of time to make a decision and you've got time then if you're successful to be able to get that activity up and running and you know, benefiting the people that you work with. Um, we, as I said before, there's a minimum time before you can reapply to us. That slightly depends on what you've asked for. If you just come for a regular grant for 12 months, it will, you can't apply for another 12 months. If I'm afraid we turn you down, we also ask you not to come back for 12 months. If, for example, you've had a multi-year grant and that's a three-year grant, you won't be able to come back until those three years are up, your end of grant report has been submitted, then you can re return to us. But as I said before, as, you know, we've got some longevity in grant making, so. We're going to be around for years to come, and um, don't feel that if you get a, if you get a, a no, that that means a no forever. It, quite, it may mean that you can come back again, and you'll, you may find you're successful next time. So, could I have the next slide, please? So, in terms of, I just thought it's helpful to run through maybe some top tips for making a, a great application. As you can imagine, um, we we deal with a lot of applications. We Harriet and I probably read thousands a year. And um, so, you know, we thought we'd put together a few things that really um, help you focus in on what makes it helpful for us to be able to get the information we need in order to be able to um, make hopefully a positive decision for you. So the first thing is we allow 10 pages for your proposal. It's up to 10 pages. If your project's very straightforward and it takes you only five to describe it because it's quite an easy thing to describe, don't worry, you don't have to fill out 10 pages. It's not a pound per page enterprise. So if you can get it all done in five pages, it's very straightforward, that's absolutely fine. And obviously in your proposal, we want you to tell us about who you are, 
what you do, why you do it, um, what, who's benefiting, what the differences you make to people's lives. Um, we don't want you to submit your detailed business plan. We really don't want you to submit, for example, a National Lottery Heritage Fund application because they ask for some very detailed and specific information in quite a lot of detail. And what we need to do, we, we want you to pick out, by all means cut and paste, the salient points from those, those detailed documents, but just take out those salient points and put them into a simple proposal for us. We'll always come back and ask you questions. If we think we'd like to see your business plan or understand it more, we'll come back and ask you that. But don't feel you've got to submit all of that in the first instance. Just follow our guidance and tell us what we need to know uh, at the beginning. Um, we're always looking for applications that are factually accurate, that stack up financially, you know, but also are really compelling to read. So, um, you know, you met me and Harriet now, we read these applications. And I think it's really, I think sometimes um, people forget when they put together an application, they get so stuck into the detail, they forget that actually we've got to sit down and read it alongside lots of other applications. So really make sure you're bringing your case to life, explain why the work you do is so important and why you need money to, in order to make your work better or improve it or continue doing what you do really well. One of the things you can do with that is to bring it to life with sort of case studies and photos. You know, if you're doing a building project, show us the really bad things about your building. Show some pictures of what's gone wrong and what you need to fix and maybe what the architect thinks would be a better solution. If you work with particular beneficiaries and you're able to share some of their stories, obviously I know sometimes they have to be redacted or names changed, then do that because I think um, all of us in our decision making at the foundation use both our head and our heart. So don't feel afraid to tell us, you know, some really life enhancing stories about how your work has made a difference. Um, I think for the trustees particularly, that tells them a really good story. They, of course, they need to see all the business stuff that you're running a good organisation. But they actually really want to know that somebody's life has been changed by the way that you work. So tell us all that. Um, when you apply, there's an opportunity to add a video if you want to, or a link to YouTube. You're very welcome to do that. And we do view those. So um, if you've got one, please add it in. However, I would say, you know, if you don't have one, please don't go out and run out and start making one on our behalf. We really don't, it's not essential. You don't get marked down if you don't have one. And I think the trustees would be worried if you were spending your precious resources making a video especially for us. But I know some organisations now have those kind of things. If you want to share that with us, you're very welcome to do so. Um, budgets, we ask you to provide income and expenditure projections for the year that you're applying for. So try and make those as clear as possible. We give you a sort of outline in our guidance of what we think that might look like with some example headings. Obviously, some of those headings might um, be, um, they might they might be um, different to the way that you run your business. That's fine. You don't have to copy it exactly, but it's to give you an example of the kind of things we're looking for in your income and expenditure budgets. Um, if you're coming to us for capital funding or project funding, then include those budgets as well. So what the trustees will want to see is what does it cost to run your organisation, and then what does this specific project or capital project cost, so they can understand the kind of context of how you're, how you're working, what, what these additional things are going to do. In essence, the budgets are really to try and tell us, you know, how do you run your organisation? What mixture of funding do you have? What, is, what are the main areas of expenditure? So that we can really get a sense of how, how you run your organisation. And also what, what questions we'd like to come back if we do to ask about items you have in your budget or issues you have with your income. So make it as clear as possible and, you know, feel free to explain anything that you think is, um, you know, slightly unusual or you think that we might not, not understand. So, you know, make, make it so that it's quite easy for us to, to see at a, at, a, at a reasonable snapshot what, what comes in and what goes out of your organisation. In terms of a funding plan, I mean, I think in a way this is about income. So we'd like to see a realistic plan. We want to basically understand how you fund the work that you do. And we would expect that to be a um, mixture of different income streams. I know that over the last year, earning income has been difficult because you haven't been able to do community fundraising, you haven't been able to hire out rooms, you haven't been able to run charity shops. So we know that there's been a, you know, a challenge there. But show us how you think that you would normally operate and where you think those bits of money will come from. 
And I think it's, it's you know, it, what trustees are really looking for there is they want to see that you've got a really diverse income plan. You're not just reliant on, I don't know, your local authority, and then you're hoping that we might give you the rest of the money, but you've actually thought through, you know, when times are tough, how you can kind of ebb and flow different streams of income in order to be able to survive. And I imagine over the last year, you've all had huge amounts of practice at that, because I think every charity across the country has had to refinance and look at how they're going to to structure themselves at a time when obviously income streams have been you know, greatly reduced. Please do tell us about your local fundraising. We know that you're not necessarily going to raise all um, your money from your local sources, but I think trustees are always really keen to hear about the local fundraising activity that you're doing. And the reason for that is that simply it just shows us that you're an organisation that your local community loves and they're prepared to put in their, their hands in their pockets, come to a bake sale, do a sponsored run, all of the things that you do locally to try and raise funds. So I think it's really, um, it's really helpful to tell trustees because it makes them feel that this is an organization that has you know, credibility in its own community and has its own local support network, even if that's not going to you know, pay all the bills for you. Um, I think it's important to um, make sure that you come, you look at, you have some funds already um, in place before you come to us. So if you have the idea of a really great um, um, a great new project, don't just come saying, we've got this new project, it's going to cost £30,000, do you want to pay for it? We want to kind of get a sense of how do you think you're going to be able to fund it? How are you going to make it sustainable going forward? You know, even if we give you some money towards it for the first year, what's the plan for making it become embedded into your organisation? The same would go, for example, for a capital project in that it's really useful to know um, not only, yes, you might want to have this new extension or new building or whatever, but tell us about how you're going to be able to afford to operate it. Because we know that, you know, it's fantastic getting a new building, but sometimes alongside that comes financial pressures in terms of greater space and bigger bills and more staffing. So we'd need to know how you, you know, you've got a really viable plan for making that work for your organisation. Um, one thing that I always recommend is that you, um, Get somebody who knows your work a little bit, doesn't necessarily know you really well, to read your proposal. Um, and it might be you have local community networks around you where somebody can just have a look through and just make sure that you're telling your story and singing, singing your own virtues in the best possible way. It's easy when you write an application to be very modest about what you do. And actually, if you get somebody who knows you quite well, they might say, well, actually, you know, I think you could say a lot more about this great work that you do. I also think that sometimes what happens, and we've all done this, when you're making a funding application, things get slightly lost in that there are lots of people who sometimes get involved and different people start editing it and some people write certain sections. And sometimes the, the narrative and the thread of the application can get a little bit muddled. So sometimes having somebody to just give it a really clear read at the end to make sure that you're really putting your best foot forward is really, can be really beneficial. And often you learn a lot about the way you might describe yourself making sure that people actually recognise your organisation and the way that you write about it. So I'd really recommend that. Um, find yourself a critical friend. Um, so the next slide, please. Common pitfalls that we see in applications, um, and we're probably all, the first one I think we're all guilty of, um, we, we, um, we do it as funders, we talk in sort of weird jargon and acronyms because we all talk in a kind of weird shorthand between us. But make, make sure that your, your application is just using fantastically plain English. You know, we, we and the trustees think you are the expert in what you do. So your job is to explain as clearly as possible what it is you do and why it's important. Don't baffle us with too much um, information or, you know, difficult acronyms. If we have to start looking stuff up to understand it, then that probably means you're slightly losing us as the audience. We're kind of already finding it a bit confusing. Um, so keep it nice and clear. I think fundraising, and we talked just on the previous slide about making your income and fundraising plan really clear. Just, you know, make sure that you, you look at the example we've got. Provide your explanations and be really honest about the situation you're in. We know you're not going to have all your funding in place. It's very unlikely you will. But you'll have a kind of mixture of things that you're confident you're going to get because you tend to raise that kind of money locally every year. You'll also have ideas about new places you're looking at, as well as things that you are a steady st streams of income, like green hire, for example. 
So by all means, it adds narrative alongside your fundraising budget that helps just give us the certainty that you're really thinking about how you raise your money and also how you can um, how, how you can create your really sustainable, you know, confident organisation. One thing we tend to see, which um, happens more often than, than you would expect, is that budgets uh, hugely detailed, very, very helpful, but for some reason somebody forgets to total them at the bottom. So we just have a list of figures across a whole table and no totals. Um, please just make sure that you've done that because um, otherwise Harriet or I have to get out our calculators, we have to work out what your organisation costs. And um, I, you know, if I were you, I'd prefer, I think it's better that you make sure your maths is right than we do the maths for you. Um, we quite often as well see that, and this goes back to the editing, is that perhaps um, um, figures aren't consistent throughout the document. So somebody might have written a covering letter saying, oh, we really want to uh, apply to you for um, 25,000 pounds. And then somewhere in the body of the text, it talks about 20,000 pounds. And then we get to the budgets and actually it's 22,000 pounds. Just make sure when you do your final edit that you've got that really clear and consistent. Otherwise we start to ask questions because we're not quite sure what it is you actually want. So please, you know, make that as clear as you can. Um, we always ask you to, to submit your latest accounts. It's really helpful, particularly during this year when things have been very challenging that we see those accounts. Um, by all means, in your, the body of your proposal, explain anything that's unusual in your account. And by that, I mean, you might have received a large legacy, but you know that's going to be designated for a new building project. You might have been operating at a deficit, but that deficit was planned in order to bring your reserves down to a sensible level. Or you might have just had a really rocky year and you just want to explain but yes, it doesn't look great for your last year's accounts, but you've got a plan for how you're going to get out of it. So the important thing with accounts is if you think there's anything that might make us, you know, open our eyes or ask questions, try and explain it to us in the proposal so that we're not jumping to conclusions and making assumptions about your, your financial stability. Um, again, you know, we, we like transparency and honesty. So just, just tell us, you know, we know that particularly over the last year, things won't have gone according to plan. And it's fine for that to happen. You know, we know that everyone is operating in an, in an environment of almost best guesstimates at the moment because nobody's been clear when to open, how they can re-engage with audiences, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then again, you'll get this from your critical friends. Make sure your narrative is nice and clear. What exactly do you want from us? How do you think we can help? And what difference will that money make? If you've applied to us before, Please make sure that you start from the beginning um, of that, of, of, of the story of, of your organisation, because um, it's really important that we know that, um, you know, whoever reads the application isn't picking up the story halfway. So even if we have if we've given you a grant before, don't start off from there. Remind us who you are, what you do and why it's so important. And then uh, the last thing is, if we have... Um, if you have any questions, we will come back to you. Please come back to us and answer those questions. And I know you're all super busy doing your fantastically good work. Um, but if we ask for questions, then um, there is a reason. You know, we need to know that information in order to put the best foot forward to trustees for you. Um, so please, if you get one of those emails, then could you provide a bit more information? Do respond. I'm afraid to say not everyone does respond. And that sometimes leaves us in a situation where trustees have slightly impartial information or in, in not quite the information that they need to make a positive decision. So come back to us if we come back to you and ask you some questions. And then I think, you know, just to, just to finish off, obviously, I mean, the message, which I'm sure I've hammered home nice and clearly is make sure you read our guidance. Then an email will go out after this to give you some more information on where to find our guidance, but as well as frequently asked questions, which will help you. And I think for, for your organisations, you know, we publish our grant making, we publish it on 360 Giving, we publish it on our website. So if you're new to us, have a look at the kind of grants we've given and the kind of levels of grants we give to organisations like yours, because that will give you a sense of how, um, how you might want to pitch your request to us. Um, so I think that's it. I've, I've given you the overview of how to apply to the foundation. Now it's your turn to ask me some questions. Um, so I shall hand over to, I think Harriet's going to help by sort of collating up some questions that come through on the chat. Yes, I've had a few questions that have come through th on the chat that I've uh, collated and things. Maybe we'll go through some of them first and then if we've got time, we'll open up for, for any extras. Um, 
So a quick one at the beginning was Derek was asking about community amateur sports clubs. Do we support them? Um, I've definitely looked at a few of those. Um, Flora, as I'm sure you uh, will agree. Um, Any yes, thoughts we on would. that? I mean, if you're, you need to be a registered charity. If you're a registered yes. charity, I mean, I would say if you're a very small organisation with a turnover of less than £10,000, then um, I think uh, you... Um, you probably, it's probably not the right funder for you, you're better off looking locally for your funding. But if your turnover is greater than £10,000 and is also a registered charity, then of course apply to us. I hope that helps, Derek. Um, then, yes, thumbs up, good, excellent. Um, so we had a few questions around core costs and project costs. So one from D um, around can core costs and project costs um, be asked for collectively in one application? Um, and also one from Joe around core costs, what proportion um, could be asked for um, for core costs? So Flora, if you could go through those. So it, proportion of funding is always difficult. I mean, what we really like you to do is, is tell us what it costs to run your organisation, how you're going to fund it and what the shortfall is. And trustees tend to take a view in that respect. As a rough kind of guidance, it, I think we're unlikely to give more than 10% of your total turnover. Um, and I'm so sorry, my, my phone is ringing. I'm going to have I'm going to have to just hand over to Harriet for a second because I think it's one of my children at school that I need to just quickly answer the phone. Harriet, do you mind just finishing off that um, question for me? Yeah, no problem. So um, core costs, uh, yeah, it tends to be roughly around... 10% of the overall um, budget. Now, this is a little bit sort of give or take because we take, over, we take into consideration the overall picture, um, but we use that as a sort of rough indication. For some smaller faith organisations or community organisations, it could be that it's actually a slightly lesser percentage. For other projects where it's something that, um, you know, they're particularly keen on, it could be a bit more. So we, we don't like to be too prescriptive, but we would say work on a basis of roughly 10%. Um, and that is also the case for a project when you have a separate um, project uh, cost. Um, I would say that um, with regards to the question around core costs and project costs in one application, occasionally we, we do obviously um, provide funds for unrestricted so um, and, and for project costs. So occasionally we do get a situation where people say to us, this is our core costs um, situation. This is our core cost budget, but we also, but they also let us know what projects they have happening. And occasionally, there is a situation where we might give support and say, you know, allocate it accordingly as to where you see it best fits. Um, it is a bit more unusual. I'm just saying, Flora, in terms of core costs and project costs being an ask in the same proposal. I'm saying it's more unusual, and sometimes the trustees might say. We, we feel this is the right sort of level to give to you, but sort of appease a portion where you see it's most needed. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, it, again, and I think it's time to take that call. Um, I think it's really yeah, important that we understand what we need the most. And I think trustees in their experience as grant makers will take a view. So don't get too hung up. I mean, some people don't even ask for a specific amount. They just tell us what it is that it costs to run the organisation, what they think their shortfall is. And the trustees will take a view in terms of how much they might um, they might give, be able to give you if they choose to support you. OK, great. And then there was also part of that question was around, um, do we need to show match funding at a certain level? I think we touched on previously that we like to see some funds having been raised when you come to the point of applying to us. So around sort of usually around 50 percent, ideally, either raised or pledged by others. Um, so that is a sort of rough indication. Yeah, I think, uh, again, I mean, like any funder, I think trustees are obviously looking for a confident organisation that's financially sustainable. So having some money in place when you come to ask, ask for some money helps to show that, you know, you're looking in all sorts of different directions in order to be able to fund the good work that you do. Um, so absolutely, I think it, it's really useful to have some capital projects. We do ask you to be about halfway there because we know it's really difficult to raise money for capital projects and trustees won't be quite ready to make an investment unless they know that you're already significantly advanced. Um, if you're looking for core costs, of course, we know that, you know, sometimes you start out the year and you've got a whole range of plans for how you're going to get income. 
I think, as I said along the way, I don't think they know that all of that isn't going to be fixed. You know, nobody's fundraising plan works out perfectly according to their, you know, to how they set it out at the beginning of the year. But I think they're looking for organisations that know that they can, you know, if they over overachieve in, you know, earned income, then there'll be less pressure on raised income. That, you know, you're able to you know, manage your, your finances in a, in a sensible way. Then Zella had asked us, do we have a fixed age range for our youth work? Um, they support people that are 11 to 25. No, we don't at all. I would say we, you, we, we are very, our youth work is very broad um, and lots of people come to us for all sorts of different community and youth work projects and there's no set age bracket in terms of the beneficiaries. So that's absolutely fine. Um, Harvey Hex Trust asks us, um, if you're not successful, um, will, will we tell you why? Um, unfortunately, we actually aren't able to, we don't have the resource to be able to tell everybody um, a reason why um, after, after um, each application. But if you are a bit concerned and you are worried and you haven't applied to us before um, and you don't know us so well, we are very happy to um, answer those questions that you might have initially or any concerns or anything that you're not sure about. So we will, as, as we said, send you guidelines that if you follow step by step, you can't go too wrong. Um, but if you tell us about your organisation, if there's anything particularly you're worried about after reading that, then we can um, answer any initial questions which might um, help you to, yeah, calm any fears you may have. I, I think also the other thing just to say about feedback, and you know, we know as funders it's something that, that lots of applicants are very keen for, is, is sometimes it's just very difficult to say why you haven't been successful on that day. I mean, obviously, trustees have to make a huge range of decisions. Those decisions are made, you know, obviously on, with each application on its own merit. But there isn't a, you know, limitless pot of funding, even though we're a very generous funder. So I think um, often when people ask for feedback, it's, it would be very difficult for me or Harriet to say exactly what it was that meant that you weren't successful because we don't have a sort of, um, we don't fund by kind of tick boxes. Sometimes it's about a, a feeling about the organisation, the way it might have presented its story. And that kind of feedback actually probably wouldn't help you, even if we knew what the answer was. We'd only be giving you very vague advice. So um, don't worry too much. If you, I mean, as I, I think the most important thing to take from this, if you haven't been successful, but you're still eligible to apply, do try again, because it could be just a different way of presenting yourself or a different project might, might work better for the trustees. And Dee had asked us a question around um, the accounts uh, and the breakdown of income streams and how that is displayed in the accounts. Um, I think I would probably just call on what Flora had said previously is that um, don't worry too much about how the accounts are displayed um, in the uh, PDF or whatever that you send them to us in. But if there's anything that you want to explain or talk about, just explain that in the proposal. Put Pop in a, a short paragraph in the proposal around the accounts and put in there anything that you want to explain about it that you want to get across to us. And as Flora said, if there are any further questions we have about the accounts or anything we're not sure about, we will also be very likely to um, contact you and, and ask you so that we've got a full um, picture. Um, Joe ha was asking around what our definition actually looks like in terms of a sensible level of reserves. Uh, this is the, this is a always a good question because um, reserves are reserves are difficult. There's a kind of um, uh, I would say a kind of Goldilocks thing about you you can't have too you know you don't have too little reserves you don't have too much. Um, I think in our guidance we always say that we would expect if you have more than twelve months of operating costs in your reserves and we would consider that to be too high. Um, so anything over a year's worth of operating costs, I think you're on the high side of the reserves. Obviously anything much, much lower than probably, um, I don't want to give you a percentage, but you know, a, a very low, an, a, an amount that makes it look like you, know, you could barely survive for a month or two, month or so, um, would also be too low for us. I think on the whole, we would look for around six to nine months worth of your operating costs. But again, that entirely depends on the type of organisation you are. Um, I think, um, you know, we know that, for example, there are certain health-based organisations that will keep a year's worth of reserves because if they had to wind down, it would be very difficult for them to do that without taking some time to do that, to look after their beneficiaries or patients properly. So there are, you know, there are lots of caveats around the reserves, but on the whole, we would expect you to have a sort of solid six months, let's say, operating costs. Um, not too much and not too little. Thanks, Flora. I'm just going to quickly go through a couple that have come up on the um, on the chat now. So, Laura, do you fund CICs? 
Um, no, I'm afraid we don't, Laura, but we do fund registered charities and CIOs um, and exempt charities, which are things like schools, churches, um, museums. Um, so that is our um, eligibility criteria. Unfortunately, we have to draw a line somewhere. Um, there was also a question from Cheryl, um, who are they are a dog rescue charity in South Wales. Um, but they have a big respite project coming up where they'll be working with other charities and organisations such as Women's Aid and the Homeless. Well, they'll be doing a project around vulnerable people in crisis. Is that something we would consider looking at? Um, without knowing the exact details, it's difficult for me to comment here because I don't want to give you the wrong advice. I mean, on the whole, we don't, um, a dog rescue charity isn't a charity that we would support. Um, so I think it sounds like it would be very borderline for us. But I think perhaps when you've looked at our guidance, if this project is slightly different and represents your work in a different way, then maybe give us a call and we can give you specific advice. Yeah, we can have you give specific advice around that. Um, Annie, we're a very small grassroots community charity, fully run by volunteers. Are we too small to apply? Depends really what your turnover is. If you're looking at, and um, if you've got a turnover of less than, our smallest grant is probably about a thousand pounds. So if you're thinking about 10% uh, 10, um, 10 of um, your total turnover, then um, it, you, we, we wouldn't look at a charity that's probably got a turnover of less than 10,000 pounds because we just couldn't give you the kind of money that you know, we wouldn't be able to make a grant to you in the same way as we would to a larger organisation. I think trustees also have a view if you're a very small organisation, very grassroots, let's say you have 5,000 pound turnover, you're probably better off just keep looking locally for the support that you need, whether that's in sort of local fundraising, you know, community foundations, people who are absolutely geared up to give smaller amounts of money to help the good work that you do. Anna had recently um, heard something around our guidelines around hospices uh, that we no longer for, that we no longer fund fund core costs for hospices. Is that the case? So hospices, um, we do. Uh, in fact, we very rarely ever funded core costs for hospices. The trustees have a very long um, history, in particularly supporting capital projects for hospices, and we know that lots of hospices have had to do major capital work in the last sort of decade or so, which the trustees have been incredibly generous towards. Hospice core costs don't tend to fall within um, their sort of sweet spot of funding. And the reason for that is there are lots of hospices across the UK, you all do fantastic work, and it's just not possible for the trustees to provide core costs for every hospice. So they're much more likely to support a capital project, or if you have a specific project, like something that you're just setting up a new hospice at home, or you want to do um, service, or you want to do, I don't know, a particular piece of work with a group of people who perhaps don't access your services in the same way, then it's more likely to be project or capital for hospices rather than just general core costs. Because we know that hospices are incredibly good at fundraising and particularly local fundraising. And we'd expect that to be covering the kind of general operating costs of that type of charity. Thank you. The last couple here. So Ruth, do you fund core costs for charities where most of the income is from statutory contracts, i.e. our income is around 80% statutory? We may do. Um, it, I suppose it goes back to my um, comment about income, wanting to see a really nice diverse portfolio of income opportunities. Um, so it, I would say it really depends what your other 20% of funding looks like. We certainly wouldn't be the only other funder alongside a statutory funder, because I think for your longevity, we'd be worried about, well, if that statutory funding falls away and we fall away, then what happens to your organisation? So if you were coming to us for a small amount it, within that 20%, then yes, you could, and, and you could show that you were looking at a diverse range of funding for that final 20%, then yes, of course, you can apply to us. Thanks, Flora. And then Derek had a comment around reserves. Um, when we talk about reserves, um, I think it's, in, right, this is an experience I've had recently um, with an application which I was helping one organisation with. And the reserves looked on the face of it, you know, more than the annual um, income. 
when we actually looked at it and found what those reserves were allocated for, i.e. replacement of building, replacement of machinery, replacement of the vehicle, etc. Um, once that was explained in a spreadsheet format, exactly what those reserves were for, then the fund, it moved the funders back into their comfort zone. So I would suggest that if anybody has a problem with reserves, if you actually say what those reserves are actually for, not just give the figure, give it broken down and say what it's for, um, that may solve the problem. I hope that comment is helpful. I think that's really helpful and I think you know always everyone it's very easy for people to you know they understand their accounts in great detail but if they don't explain them to us you know when we look at a balance sheet obviously we're always looking for things like tangible assets and investments we're really looking at your free reserves level and by that we mean stuff that could be available cash to you not the stuff that you know obviously your tangible assets you can't sell it necessarily because you can't operate if you do don't sell your building so um we, you know, we, we, we're pretty experienced at looking at accounts, but occasionally if there are weird anomalies or things that you, for example, designated unrestricted funds towards, can tell us exactly what that's for and what the rationale behind is it, and then trustees can make a more informed decision. So that's everything that's in the chat. I don't know if we have any other time for anything else, but um, that's, that was everything that came up. Brilliant. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, Harriet. It's been really enlightening to hear about your grant programmes and really interesting. Um, and uh, we will be sending the information out after um, the webinar today by email. So thank you for joining us. Um, for well, thank you so much for inviting us. And, you know, I hope you found it helpful. And I really, I really do hope that, you know, it's encouraged lots of you to, if you have never applied, or even if you have, but you haven't done so for a long time, just to, you know, make, make an application to us. I think, um, you know, people forget that actually the only way we can give grants is when people submit applications. So often we do these talks and people think, oh, that's a great idea. I'll get around to doing that application. But put it on your to-do list and absolutely do it because that's the only way we can send you money is if you send us an application that trustees approve. So please, you know, absolutely get around to making the application. That's great. And I'll send you the, um, I'll send Nicola the, our guidelines and, a, and a, a list of helpful links that should help you as well as our team contact details. So uh, we'll send that over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. So now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Karen Hall, um, who will be able to give us details about our new community grants programme, which is now open for applications. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, I would um, just, just start with a caveat that I'm sure a lot of you will have heard me do a little presentation on our, our grants before, but um, please please do sort of stay with us because uh, as Nicola said, it's a, a slightly new, um, a slightly different uh, programme that we'll be starting uh, after we've ended our, our coronavirus funding. So I will just uh, share my screen with you if I can find the right... Um, um, this, excuse me, I'm just trying to find the right uh, screen. It's not wanting me to. I'm happy to share, Karen, if you want to. Sorry? Do, I'm happy to share my screen if you want to do next slide. Oh, OK, yes. Do you want to do that? That'd be helpful. Yes, I don't know why. It's come up with a completely different. Um, yeah, do that. And then, oh, hold on. Yeah, well, that's probably the easiest thing to do. OK, right. So, um, so many of you will know which are community foundation we give grants to groups um, we also give grants to some individuals through some specific programs um, particularly around fuel poverty and education but today we're just talking about grants to groups um, we do provide some information and advice for groups alongside our partners like um, voluntary action swindon wessex community action um, and uh, we do also do a lot of support for donors to give to their community. So a lot of very local um, individuals or companies or trusts that want to give in Wiltshire and Swindon. Um, and uh, also we do a lot of exploring need in our communities and we'll share a little bit about that later as well. So let's go on to the next slide, Nicola. Oh, okay, so our new community grants programme. So what we've done is taken some of our experience and learning from our uh, COVID grant programmes and had us sort of think about what we would normally do um, and sort of um, kind of applied some of that learning uh, to come up with our new community grants programme. 
So uh, you will be familiar previously with our foundation grants and we had main grants, which were £5,000 a year for up to three years. And we had small grants, which was sort of £2,000 a year for up to two years. We now have one programme, community grants programme, and you can apply for a grant for up to three years. So you can apply for one year, two years or three years. Um, our minimum grant will be around £750 and our maximum grant is, is going back to the £5,000. Um, but obviously that can be over three, up to over three years. Um, and again, we would have a maximum within that of £5,000 if it's towards a capital programme or a capital um, project of some description. Um, and those... Um, that those applications need to be for projects that um, will improve people's lives in some way. So I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So let's go on to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these are our priorities. So you're, you're, these will feel familiar, but we've, we've sort of um, changed the wording and changed some of the emphasis a little bit. So we're still focusing on local grassroots, small to medium sized organisations that are working with people on low income. So that's our focus. We used to talk a lot about disadvantage and it got quite complicated. So now we are looking at people on low income. So communities that can't afford to provide this support for themselves in some way. We're particularly focusing at the moment on projects that address the impact of coronavirus, because uh, we know that's going to be with us for some time. Um, and supporting children and young people, um, projects and work that prevents or alleviates poor mental health, and um, projects that tackle poverty and inequality and its effects. So again, they're, they're quite broad. And the thing that you need to remember is that we are happy to consider any application, even if it falls outside of that, where a group or an organisation has identified a need and preferably they've identified that need from the community. The community have expressed that need and the group is wanting to meet it. So it doesn't have to fall into those priorities, but um, can do. Oh, what's happened here? Oh. <laughs> Oh, okay, so, oh, it's, it seems to want to be scrolling through for some reason. <laughs> Sorry, Nicola. Um, so who we fund? So um, this, this should be familiar and it hasn't really changed. So a constituted voluntary group um, or community organization, a registered charity, not-for-profit companies, including community interest companies, but, but the majority of directors must receive no payment for the company, so from the company. So essentially it is operating like a charity um, and currently not in receipt of one of our community grants. If you've got one of our coronavirus grants at the moment, you are still eligible to apply for a community grant, but once you've applied and been awarded one of our community grants, then, um, uh, you, you won't be able to apply again until that, that grant has ended. Um, we will obviously be taking into consideration how much funding your organisation has received from the coronavirus um, programme. If you do make, a, make an application to the community grant, some organisations may have had, because it's been possible to re have repeat um, grants through, through that programme. So that, there's a little bit of a caveat there. Um, and as usual, organisations need to be um, a, a locally based organisation or a regionally based organisation working in Wiltshire and Swindon. Uh, regionally means sort of in the south or southwest of England, um, but obviously the majority of beneficiaries of the grant that you apply for would need to be in Wiltshire or Swindon. You can be a branch of a national organisation as long as you've got a local management committee, your own constitution and your own bank account. So you're sort of operating as a local charity, but you're just affiliated or a branch of a national organisation. You're right to go on to the next slide, Nicola. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. <laughs> um, so um, eligibility requirements. Um, 
So your organisation must have an active voluntary uh, management committee with at least three people. And those people cannot be related to each other um, or in a long term relationship or living at the same address. So if you've got more than three and two of them are married, for example, that's OK, as long as you've got at least three other people that are not related in that same way. Um, and then we would expect to see the following um, financial arrangements and documents in place. So we would need you to have a bank account with at least two signatories. Again, they cannot be related to each other. Again, we would expect to see less than 12 months running costs in unrestricted reserves. Uh, we, uh, as the discussion we've just had, we would look at designated funds. So again, it's really important that we would understand what your reserves are actually allocated for um, in, in, in determining that. Um, we would want to see financial records or accounts. Um, obviously, the size of your organisation will depend on how much detail that goes into, but, but something sufficient that shows us what um, is coming in and going out. Um, a financial plan is really helpful, um, showing your expected income and expenditure in your reserves. So we, again, we know the um, position, financial position of your organisation really clearly. A recent bank statement so that we know what your bank details are. And a constitution. And also, this is something that we're sort of focusing on a little bit more at the moment, a safeguarding policy and some sort of equalities or equal opportunities policy. But don't worry if you haven't got those things in place. We will talk about that um, with you when you've um, made the application. But if you've got those things, it's really, really important for us to have a look at them. Um, but we can discuss that with you. Um, New organisations, if you're, if you're newly setting up and you don't have any of those things in place, it will be possible for you to make um, an application, but we would need you to do that under the umbrella of another organisation that does all have all those things in place. So another constituted organisation. That's fine. OK, can we move on to the next slide? OK, so in terms of what you can apply um, to do, so you can apply for a grant to continue something that you've already got going. Um, you can apply for something that is a brand new activity and you can apply for any reasonable costs for your organisation or project, including your core running costs, specific project and activity costs and capital costs. So buildings and equipment. But again, we would say with capital costs, um, you need to have the majority of what is um, uh, what you require for that for that project um, and you can only apply to us for up to five thousand pounds for a capital project um, and you must um, plan to start spending the grant within six months of when it's awarded so you need to be applying for us to us for something that that you need you know fairly quickly you might have to go on to the next slide Nicola yeah um, this is the list again of things that we don't fund, this hasn't really changed, so um, we can't um, fund money that's going to be paid to individuals or families. Obviously we've got a few uh, separate programmes that do that, but our money um, grants to groups cannot be used to pay individuals or families directly. Um, activities which duplicate an existing service, so this is something that is important with applications to make sure you understand what else is going on in the area that you're working in so that you're complementing and not duplicating services. We can't fund one-off or sponsored events, uh, the advancements of religion or medical research and equipment, animal welfare, party political activities, um, individuals we've already said, schools or statutory bodies um, such as sort of parish councils. We have done some funding to, to town or parish councils through, through coronavirus, but that was specifically for coronavirus um, related activities, but on, on usual uh, sort of, on business as usual, we, we are not able to fund those bodies. So can we go um, on? To, although I would say they might be good, um, I don't know if they work as umbrella bodies, Jane. For, for, for um, we prefer not, but we could on a case by case basis. But okay, yeah, sorry, that just came. Out but but we could, we we could always talk about that. Mm. Okay, um, and then um, yeah, so we're now currently open on our website for applications. There's a slightly different application form 
Um, and I think we just reiterate everything um, that has previously been discussed about what, what makes a good application, um, particularly being clear and succinct. Um, we'll be um, making decisions four times a year. Um, so you can put in an application at any point at which it's um, going to be useful for you. This year we'll be making decisions sort of late August, November and March. So for the remaining of this financial year, they are the, the sort of dates that we'll be making decisions. Um, and, um, and then you'll probably see other, other grant programmes sort of opening up with... Um, uh, throughout the year, um, so do keep an eye on our website. And if you don't already receive our um, uh, e-bulletins regularly, then it would be good to sign up to those. You can do that through our website because they will tell you when other grant programs are opening up. And uh, there's our contact details there. So that's just a quick um, run through. All the information I've shared with you this morning is on our website. Um, there will be links to other um, documents that will give you guidance on things like the safeguarding and the equalities and also how you can use um, some of the data that we have sort of been creating and, and you know some of the research how you can use some of that to back up your applications as well um, yeah so I think that's probably everything you need to check out the website <laughs> thanks Karen that's brilliant um, there aren't any specific questions in the chat, so I'll, I'll open up the floor if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask us relating to our community grants or, or any of anything else relating to grants programmes at all. Well, um, you do, do know where we are if you do have any questions and I will email links um, to um, our um, online application forms and as well the resources from Garfield Western Foundation after the webinar today. I just wanted to share with you, um, should we go through this Karen? I think it's very much very similar to yeah. what um, Harriet and Flora presented um, and what the priorities were for um, Garfield Western but just some yeah. considerations as well um, when making an application. So again um, clearly explain what you're doing, who you are, what activity you'd like to fund, where and how, and, and, and trying to avoid that jargon language or long explanations. Um, if you can use evidence um, about the need that you have identified, either through surveys that you have undertaken, um, statistics or feedback, and also provide case studies, um, or always good, um, as Harriet and Flora said, it's very compelling within your ask to have those. Um, and at the foundation, we are putting together a report that we have um, commissioned over the last 12 months that looks at the needs that have been identified within the county. Um, so that will also be available through our website, I believe. Yes. Um, tell us about what difference um, your organisation, your project will make to the lives of the people that you're benefiting. Um, and will, will the benefit um, people that are um, undertaking that activity, will they be making a contribution? Um, and if they can't, that's absolutely fine, but we'd like to know why. And um, how you will measure the success of your project. And again, the, the budget, that's really important. Um, what is the total cost and how much are you asking from us? What are you asking a contribution to us? And um, where will the shortfall be funded from? Um, that's really key. Um, other sources of support as well. So um, on our website, we have a website listing funding opportunities that are open um, and that's that's being updated um, with lists of um, new programmes and COVID related grant programmes available. We also have a free searchable database um, which you can use as well um, and the links on there. Um, we are working together with um, Wessex Community Action and um, Voluntary Action Swindon as well um, with a range of um, events and training over the next um, year. I think Carol's kindly um, sent us a link in the chat to her next trustee event which is taking place in Swindon as well. So I'll also send you a link. So our future events. So we have um, uh, one-to-one um, sessions that we um, hold monthly where you can book these 
via Eventbrite if you have a question at all about applying for grants, applying for R funding, or anything centered around governing, governance, um, please do book one of our monthly advice sessions. We have got a workshop which is taking place this week on Thursday um, about using data to, to demonstrate your charity's impact. There are still places available, so if you'd like to come along, then please do book a place. And then the next ones after that, we have a short break in August, and the next one's in September and October. And again, visit our Eventbrite page to book your places on those workshops. Um, and, and that's it from us today. Um, I don't think there's any more questions, but, but do um, contact us if you do have any. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. I hope you found it a useful event and we'll see you at some of our next ones. Thanks.